Good morning to every to everyone. Uh, the first uh, lecture this morning is uh, a tale of two polytopes by Holger Dulin from the University of Sydney. Thank you very much, Holger, for accepting the invitation. Uh, please, uh, you can uh, begin when you want. All right. Sure. Thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, I'm not Emmanuel. Uh, it would be uh, much uh, nicer to join you in Madrid, but uh, unfortunately, I guess uh, I am sitting in Sydney. It's uh, five o'clock here. Um, and uh, we all got used to these Zoom talks. Anyway, maybe you'll meet some of my family uh, if, uh, <laughs> if they run through the screen, because uh, I have to actually be in ho at home. We are in lockdown in Sydney again. Um, Anyway, so uh, tale of two polytopes. Uh, yeah, so actually one of these polytopes is a momentum polytope. Uh, so it is related to the conference. And the other one uh, is, uh, is just a moduli space. And I'll talk about uh, the relation between these two. Uh, uh, but before I start, let me uh, say that this is joint work with uh, my PhD students, uh, Diana Nguyen and uh, Sean Dawson. And uh, they did most of the work, of course. All right, um, so um, so this is kind of a rough overview of, uh, of, the, uh, of the talk, if you want, in, in terms of some pictures. Um, so we're starting on the geodesic flow on S3. Um, and I will only talk about S3 in, in this talk, but uh, most of the things that I'm saying actually uh, are, are general and they work on any sphere. Um, so then, uh, by separation of variables, um, we can arrive at a, a family of integrable systems in a natural way. And uh, this family of integrable systems uh, has a moduli space, uh, and that is a polytope itself. That's a, the Stashev polytope. And for the three-dimensional sphere, uh, that uh, turns out to be a pentagon. And uh, all these, uh, each point here in this uh, pentagon, including the boundary, corresponds to a way to separate variables uh, by, by uh, well, orthogonal uh, coordinates um, on the sphere. And uh, thus gives us an integrable system. I'll explain how that works in, in more detail. Um, that is not quite the system we want to study, uh, then we also do a reduction. Uh, this system uh, lives on T star S3 to begin with, uh, but uh, we'll uh, do a reduction uh, by the flow, uh, by the S1 flow of the Hamiltonian almost. Um, when I'm saying sphere, I actually mean round sphere. So I'm talking about uh, the, the simplest case. And uh, then you all know that uh, the geodesic flow on the round sphere, the geodesics are great circles. And so the flow of uh, the Hamiltonian of that system is, has a periodic flow, uh, not with constant period. Uh, and we'll come to that. Uh, if we have such a S1 action, we can reduce by it. And that's what we're going to do. And uh, then we arrive at uh, the actual system that, uh, that we're studying which is an integrable system on a two Grassmannian, uh, so a Grassmannian of two planes. Uh, and when we do this for S3, then in fact, this is S2 cross S2, right? It's the kind of simplest uh, uh, Grassmannian uh, there is. And here we will construct a momentum map uh, that I call J and uh, the image of that map uh, will, will be found. And I'm uh, going to explain how that works. And uh, what is interesting, I guess, for us is that uh, no matter where we are in this moduli space, so for all these integral systems, for this two parameter family of integrable system, this momentum polytope is rigid. It's always the same. It is a uh, triangle. This is not a Delzan triangle. Um, uh, but in this family, there are some cases that are toric, there are some cases that are semi toric, and I'll uh, explain where they are. Uh, and uh, the, the main theorem is basically what I just uh, explained. Uh, and I'll, I'll work my way towards this theorem again. But uh, let me just uh, uh, state it in the beginning. Uh, so every integrable system that is obtained by separation of variables, the geodesic flow on S3 and reduction, 
has a continuous piecewise smooth momentum map whose image is a rigid triangle. And uh, now the moduli space, the edges of that polytope, they correspond to systems with a global S1 action. Two of these edges correspond to semi toric systems and uh, other edges uh, have hyperbolic singularities and uh, they're not uh, semi toric in, in the strict sense. Um, and the corners of this uh, pentagon, they correspond to uh, systems that have uh, either a global T2 action or an almost global T2 action. Uh, so one of the corners is, uh, corresponds to toric systems and uh, other corners are systems with toric degenerations. Okay, so that's in some sense the, the end of the talk. I mean, I, so what I'm now I'm going to explain this in, in a lot uh, more detail. Okay, uh, I guess in pictures, uh, again, uh, the statement of the theorem was here's this pentagon, this is the modular space of this family of integrable systems. Um, so in the interior, uh, there's only a local T2 action as for any integrable system, um, but uh, nothing global. Uh, on the edges, there is one global S1 action. Um, and uh, for two of these edges, the system is semi-toric and for one corner, the system is toric. Um, right, so that's, uh, that's the situation and, uh, and you will see uh, how these systems uh, arise. Okay, so now I will start explaining this, uh, uh, this pentagon or the generalization of that a, a bit more. So I'll first explain one of my polytopes. Um, so this, uh, this poly polytope is called a Stashev polytope and uh, or also called an associahedron, uh, Kn. And I guess this I will explain for arbitrary n, uh, but then we will fix uh, n uh, to uh, four, which is uh, the case of the sphere, um, the three sphere. So, okay, so what's an associahedron? So every vertex uh, in an associahedron corresponds to a way to insert n minus two pairs of parentheses into n objects. Okay, so let's say n is three, uh, then we have three objects. I'll just use the numbers one, two, three, and then I have to insert one pair of parentheses into these. Well, okay, there's only two ways uh, to do that. And these are the vertices of, uh, of this associahedron. Uh, so if I have uh, four, uh, n is four, uh, then I have to insert two pairs of uh, parentheses uh, into uh, four objects. And uh, here are these five ways uh, that you can do that. Um, and of course, uh, it gets more and more complicated when you uh, increase n. When n is five, then you have 14 uh, vertices. Uh, that's one of the many things that the Catalan number counts, by the way. Um, so uh, how many ways you can do this? So that's the number of vertices. So how do we construct uh, a polytope out of this? Um, now you have to know what are the edges. So the edges are uh, basically the associative rule and that's why it's called associahedron. So if you can go from, for example, this case here uh, where two, three is in bracket and four is out and then those are in bracket again, uh, you can use the associative rule to write that as two, uh, times three, four. Right? Uh, and that means these two uh, corners are connected by an edge. These two vertices are connected by an edge. Okay. Um, in that way, you can also think of, a, of an edge as something that has uh, one pair of uh, parentheses less. So if you basically just get rid of this uh, pair of parentheses here, then it corresponds to that. Uh, edge. Okay, so K2 is a point, K3 is a line segment, and K4 is a pentagon. So this is the interesting case for us. Uh, and K5 is a polyhedron with nine faces and uh, so on. Uh, I'll actually show some pictures of this uh, K5 just because it's uh, so pretty. Uh, so this is uh, fortunately not the case that we're talking about, but uh, if we go to the next dimension to S4, uh, then this is the moduli space of uh, the ways that you can separate variables uh, 
by orthogonal coordinate transformations uh, on S4. And that one has nine faces, 21 edges, and 14 vertices. Um, and it's made of six pentagons and th three foregons. Uh, and it looks kind of uh, as if these are regular, but uh, in fact, uh, this is what is called a, a near miss uh, Johnson polytope, uh, where they're very close to regular, uh, but they're not actually quite regular. Okay, but anyway, that's uh, just an aside. So um, let me uh, now also label uh, the edges. So this is the polytope that we're concerned with. Um, and uh, for example, um, this edge here uh, corresponds to uh, one pair of parentheses inserted. And it's the one pair, uh, basically, that uh, corresponds to uh, using associative law to go from here to here. Right? So when you do that, so here, three, four uh, is a block, right? And uh, you use the associative law to do uh, one times two and then times the block three, four, or here you do two times the block three, four uh, first and uh, well, the first times one. Okay, and in this way, uh, you can uh, attach these labels uh, to uh, this uh, polytope. And in the center is uh, something that has, does not have any parentheses. Um, to any such expression uh, corresponds a tree. Uh, to the vertices, these are binary trees. Uh, and in general, there are more complicated trees, but they just encode uh, this uh, way of multiplying these objects. Right? Um, so here, this would say we're multiplying three things, one, two, and here, first we have to multiply three, four. So three and four get to multiply it first, and then they get multiplied to one and two, right? So that's how, how this tree works. And that's actually how uh, these expressions would be represented in, in a computer. Anyway, uh, so I hope you have some idea what uh, this Stashev polytope is about now. Uh, and uh, we will see uh, that this is actually related to separation of variables uh, and uh, let me uh, start talking about that story a little bit. Uh, so this was actually first done uh, by Lamy uh, in, in the quantum case, or he was interested in the heat equation. So um, basically, so he, he tried to separate uh, the Laplacian. And then Jacobi did uh, the analog for the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. Uh, and uh, Neumann, as a student of Jacobi, developed this further. And uh, from this emerged a, a theory for separation of variables. Uh, and uh, these uh, names, Steckel, Levi, Civita, and Eisenhardt, uh, uh, did major work on this. Uh, and the subject was maybe dormant. I guess this is stopped in the 30s uh, until uh, in 86, uh, Kalnins and Miller, they came up with a combinatorial description of separation of variables. So they basically, uh, these uh, trees that you just saw, they can be interpreted as ways of separation of variables. And that's uh, the work of Kalmans and Miller. Um, and then very recently, Schirbel and Veselov, they realized that uh, you can organize all of this uh, by way of these Stashev polytopes. Okay, uh, and uh, so just to uh, write some familiar names uh, to this, uh, uh, or some of them at least. So uh, in the middle here, we have elliptic or ellipsoidal coordinates, Jacobi elliptic coordinates. I'll explain what they are in a little while. Um, here, a kind of cylindrical coordinate system or doubly cylindrical because we're on SD. Uh, so there are, if you embed that in our four, there are four variables that we need to deal with. There's an oblate uh, spheroidal coordinate system. Then there's e what we usually call spherical coordinates. Um, on this corner, on this corner, here's a prolate uh, ellipsoidal coordinate system. And then there is an unusual uh, family called uh, Lamy uh, subgroup uh, that sits on, on this edge. And in, in yellow here, I attached the number of parameters that you have uh, with such a coordinate system. So the corners have no parameters, uh, the edges have one, and uh, the general case 
uh, has two essential parameters. Okay, um, so um, now I will explain now uh, the, the general case, at least elliptic coordinates, and I uh, will talk about these degenerate cases uh, uh, a little bit further down the line. Um, but uh, yeah, before I actually uh, come to separation of variable, because that's uh, rather technical, uh, I wanted to just describe in a more geometric way uh, how we get uh, these integrable systems that I'm going to talk about. So uh, geodesic flow on the round sphere, as I already said, the geodesics are great circles. So take any two plane in R4 through the origin and intersect that with F3 and that gives you a uh, geodesic um, with orientation. Right? The, the plane is oriented and then you get two geodesics uh, the two for these two oriented planes. Um, let's say X and P are in R4 and the sphere is normalized to radius one and P is in the tangent space of the sphere. And then uh, we can uh, just write down the Hamiltonian this way, P squared, uh, length of P squared divided by two. Um, and uh, well, the geometry already tells us that all these geodesics are uh, closed. Um, but for an S1 action, we want constant period as well. And, uh, and this is actually something that uh, we've seen yesterday in, in Alexei's talk. Um, so what we should do is just take the square root of H uh, and this actually has a constant period now. Uh, so this actually generates an S1 action. I want to do a reduction by invariance now. Um, uh, and I want to reduce by this S1 action. And uh, the invariance of this actions are uh, these uh, components of the angular momentum, if you want. Uh, but uh, since we're in 4D, uh, we just uh, write this either as a wedge product, edge X wedge P, or uh, as a, an anti-symmetric matrix, um, which you can write this way, X transpose P minus P transpose X. So this is an SO4. And it has rank two. Uh, because we are coming from two planes. Um, and uh, these Lij, the entries in this matrix, uh, they're usually called Plücker coordinates. Okay, and to do the symplectic quotient by this S1 action, what you do is, well, you first fix your energy, you fix your uh, Hamiltonian, and then you're in the unit tangent bundle. And uh, now uh, to do the quotient, you have to just uh, identify each uh, great circle uh, that is still possible to uh, a point. And that's exactly, uh, since great circles are two planes, that's exactly the two Grassmannian, the oriented Grassmannian of two planes in R4. Right? So that's our reduced space. Okay, uh, so this uh, space comes with naturally with the Lipposon structure of SO4. Uh, We've also seen in Alexei's talk uh, yesterday. Um, and uh, it is uh, a cojoint orbit uh, of this uh, algebra, of this group, uh, capital SO4. And, uh, and in fact, uh, it is S2 cross S2. And uh, so now the idea is uh, if we have an integral system upstairs, uh, Hamiltonian H F1, F2 with the canonical variables uh, upstairs, then this descends uh, to an integrable system uh, G1, G2, S2 cross S2. And uh, at the moment, this is not clear why this uh, would be the case, but uh, anyway, uh, just to give you the result uh, to begin with. Uh, um, this family that I will describe, you can write down G1 and G2 uh, in these variables of the reduced space, these Plücker coordinates, uh, as sum over Lij squared times Ekel. And what I mean here is that uh, you're summing over Ij and then you choose the other two indices, uh, K and L, that are different. Uh, and here, uh, in a similar way, uh, sum over Lij squared times Ekel. 
Um, and there are parameters in here, E1, E2, E3, and E4, and they come from the separating coordinate system, as we will see. Okay, so that's our, our integrable system. Um, so where does it now uh, actually come from? Um, I wanted to make another remark here. Um, both Alvaro and uh, Alexei um, made this comment that uh, if we study integral systems in, in our setting, we don't really care about the Hamiltonian. And uh, here we're kind of taking this uh, point of view to the extreme and that we're reducing by the Hamiltonian. Uh, and in the end, we get an integrable system uh, that has just these commuting functions. Um, and the original Hamiltonian has disappeared from the problem. Um, right, if you like uh, uh, identities like this, let me just flash them up. So Lij are these angular momenta. Uh, this Poisson structure on S4 uh, has two Casimirs, uh, and one of them is the Hamiltonian because we're reduced by the Hamiltonian. So that's the sum of all these Ls. Uh, and the other one is uh, what is called the Plücker relation. That's the condition uh, that this matrix actually has rank two, this matrix L in SO4. Um, so that we're actually dealing with uh, a two plane. Um, but why is this S2 cross S2? And of course there's nice geometric ways of seeing this, uh, but uh, here I'm showing you an algebraic way of seeing this. Uh, if you add C1 and two C2, uh, then you see you can kind of uh, group them uh, into squares. And uh, so then this will become a sum of three squares squared. And that's exactly uh, equal to 2h again. Uh, but you can also subtract these two Casimirs uh, and then you get a different sum of squares uh, equal to 2h again. And uh, so those are the two spheres uh, S2 cross S2. And uh, Alvaro mentioned actually the systems as the coupled angular momenta system. Uh, this is when you talk about the two spheres, you would choose different coordinates on these two spheres. Uh, in our constructions, it's natural to stick to these original coordinates Lij, but uh, it doesn't matter really, of course. Okay, so um, let's uh, talk about elliptic coordinates. Um, so these are not uh, uh, the, the usual uh, ellipsoidal coordinates in Rn, but these are elliptic coordinates on Sn. Uh, but we are working in R n plus one, so uh, and we're, we're interested in uh, these x's. We restrict them to the sphere. And uh, so, how are these coordinates defined? You write down this uh, um, define this q uh, as x i squared sum over x i squared divided by lambda minus e i. And here you have parameters e i in the construction. Uh, and uh, uh, for the three dimensional sphere, there are four of these parameters. And the roots of this uh, q, they are the new coordinates. And we call them s1, s2, et cetera. Um, and, uh, this, uh, this is a poly polynomial uh, in, in lambda, um, and it has exactly uh, n roots. And they're actually separated by these EIs because this uh, diverges to infinity uh, at each EI. And so that's how you see that the, there must be a, a root uh, S uh, between any two E's. And now you can write your metric, uh, this, the metric of the round sphere uh, in these coordinates. And uh, uh, this is an orthogonal coordinate system. Uh, so this remains uh, uh, a diagonal metric, uh, but you get these uh, factors hi, and I don't want to write them out, uh, uh, but this is a classical calculation. Um, <clears throat> so as I said, so that's kind of how the subject started. Um, and, and a little bit later uh, was this development uh, that actually came up with a uh, theory of uh, separation of variables. And uh, this starts with Steckel. And uh, so Steckel uh, gave a general uh, procedure of how to uh, separate variables. 
Um, but in some sense, uh, you can also say he gave a procedure how to cook up uh, integral systems, and uh, here's how you can uh, cook them up. Uh, so you take any n by n matrix, uh, and uh, the special thing is that in the ith row of this matrix, uh, you have a function of si only, right? S, I mean, in, in each entry in the ith row, uh, you have functions of si, but there can be different functions uh, in each entry. Um, and uh, then uh, you take the inverse of that matrix and uh, basically multiply it by momentum squared. So here we have now, uh, after uh, doing this chord change, we have coordinates si and uh, the conjugate momenta are called pi. So this is the standard symplectic form of these variables. Um, and the, the little theorem is that these functions fi, they form an integrable system. So they are functions in involution. Um, but they are quite uh, mixed up because of this inverse. I mean, you started here with something that is separated uh, in, in the sense, right, that uh, these uh, entries depend only on a single variables in, in one row. Uh, but uh, taking the inverse uh, gives you uh, quite complicated functions and uh, they make these integrals. And uh, while this is an integral system, it's a bit harder if you start with uh, some uh, given, uh, let's say metric, uh, and then the Hamiltonian that corresponds to that metric, then uh, you have to say, well, one of these uh, Fs, let's say the first one, uh, has to actually have uh, entries uh, that are given, then uh, you can't just uh, choose an arbitrary uh, matrix to start with. Um, and uh, then uh, you call this a stack of system that corresponds to that uh, geodesic flow. And what Eisenhardt showed is that uh, uh, up to some equivalent natural equivalences on both sides that, uh, that these Steckel systems, uh, they are uh, in one-to-one -one correspondence with orthogonal separate, separable coordinate systems. Um, right, sorry. Okay. Um, these integrals by constructions are uh, quadratic in momenta. And uh, so there are very special integral systems that have that property. Um, and well, and here is uh, the particular way of separation of variables that we're going to use. Uh, so the entries of this matrix phi, where I said where the ith row depends on SI only, are a bit like a van der Mount, uh, type matrix. Uh, so you have these powers of F SI. Uh, and uh, but then divided by uh, a product uh, of uh, factors where these EIs enter. So this A, some polynomial that'll, that'll appear uh, often in, in the following. Um, and uh, when you do the construction with this matrix phi, then it produces uh, the metric uh, in, let's say in F1, and it produces extra integrals. Um, and so it gives you an integrable system. All right. Um, so, in a way, I guess this is the problem is is, is solved by what I just said uh, by by doing this way of general separation that uh, goes back to Steckel. Um, um, but uh, another way of uh, thinking about it, uh, and and this is important for us later when we construct our uh, momentum map. Um, is that, that really uh, doing Hamilton-Jacobi theory. And that's what Jacobi wanted to, to separate. So in our case, this is our Hamiltonian with these uh, scale factors HI, which depend on all the S's. Um, and uh, the Hamilton-Jacobi equation uh, is this uh, first order uh, PD. That's the one that, uh, that we're trying to separate. Uh, and uh, the result is that uh, we get uh, this S, which 
you may think of as a generating function for an economical transformation uh, as a sum of functions SI, where each SI depends on little SI only. So it's additive separation. Here's again this A, and then there's another polynomial that appears, and that contains all the separating, all the um, separation constants. Um, so one of them is uh, the energy itself, and the other, so we could just call them eta, they are the values of uh, the other separation constants. And uh, so in the end, uh, you get a very simple uh, separated system. Um, so this is now one degree of freedom Hamiltonian system. And I omitted the indices I here uh, because uh, it's actually the same uh, um, function uh, for all I's. And you can think of this as now one degree of freedom Hamiltonian system. Um, and that describes uh, uh, this, this uh, that you get after separation. Um, this, uh, when you allow S to be complex, then this is a hyperelliptic curve. And in our case, A is of degree four, R is of degree two. Um, so I think this is a genus three hyperelliptic curve uh, on which the system separates. Okay, I want to talk also a little bit about uh, the uh, quantum case um, or the Laplace equation or Hellman's equation is uh, the, the better way of saying it. Uh, you can separate uh, the Laplacian in the same coordinate system and it essentially goes the same way. Here are these scale factors and G is uh, just the, the determinant of your metric. So the, the product of all these guys. Um, when you separate the Schrodinger equation, uh, then you assume that this is a product uh, of these functions psi. Um, uh, but much of this uh, uh, goes in the same way. Uh, you end up, uh, however, with a boundary value problem if you want. And uh, if you write this out, uh, then this becomes a very nice uh, second order differential equation. Um, a, remember, is a polynomial, R is a polynomial, uh, and this is a second order differential equation for one of these factors, psi, uh, and it's actually a Fuchsian equation. That means uh, there are some singular points where A vanishes. Uh, that's exactly uh, at each of these uh, parameters, EI, um, but they are regular, uh, and infinity is also a regular point. So Fuchsian equation uh, is in the way the, the nicest uh, thing you could get uh, from this process and you do get it uh, in this example. Okay, um, so um, that is the interior of the Staschev polytope. Uh, and now uh, we want to look at the degenerations as well. So uh, in Jacobi's construction, you assume that these E's, these four parameters are distinct. Uh, but uh, if you allow equality, you get degenerate cases and uh, on the Staschev polytope, uh, for example, the top vertex uh, with this bracketing, uh, it means actually that E1 is equal to E2 and that E3 is equal to E4. Uh, so this is a kind of a cylindrical coordinate system. You have a, a symmetry, a rotational symmetry in your coordinate system in the one, two plane and a rotational symmetry in the three, four plane. Since when R4, you can have two of these. So uh, if you want double cylindrical coordinates. And uh, in more complicated cases, the limiting process is not uh, just as simple as just setting uh, parameters equal, um, but it can be uh, a bit more complicated. Um, there is the analog in the quantum mechanical setting uh, is that you have this Fuchsian equation. Um, so uh, a second order differential equation with uh, polynomial coefficients. Um, and uh, if you make uh, these E's equal, uh, that is called confluence of regular singular points in that setting. So this also has a very nice uh, classical uh, interpretation in, in the setting of the quantum mechanics. All right, and uh, so now uh, I'm just uh, showing you this uh, picture again uh, with the 
all the information so that uh, uh, you can see. So one, two, three, four are cylindrical where E1 and E2 are equal and E3, E4 are equal, that's cylindrical. Um, oblate means we make E1 and E2 equal. Uh, prolate are E2 and E3 and so on. Right? So that's uh, the way you get uh, all these coordinate systems. And the graph is really maybe a better a representation of this, and that was Collins and Miller's uh, contribution to to say you can how you actually construct the coordinate transformation you can extract from this graph. Um, so they had a slightly different notation. Uh, well, they normalized uh, the first two to zero and one, uh, and then called the remaining ones a and b, and uh, that's also what you would do if you are in the Fuchsian equation setting. Uh, and then you can label these trees and, uh, and they exactly tell you how you uh, build your coordinate system. All right, um, I should uh, speed up a little bit. Uh, so uh, where's our momentum map? So I, I talked a lot about uh, this uh, stretch polytope, uh, but now we need our momentum uh, polytope as well. So the momentum polytope is, uh, constructed in a very classical way, we have a system that is separable. And uh, if the system is separable, uh, <clears throat> then we can explicitly write down a particular set of action variables, uh, dual Arnold action variables. So these action variables that are guaranteed by the, the theorem to exist uh, locally near a regular point. Um, and uh, they're given by, uh, some kind of abelian integrals. And uh, what we have to integrate uh, are these p's that we get from separation. And uh, remember, this is degree two polynomial that depends on the separation constants. And here's just a product uh, over these parameters. Uh, and uh, so that's our, uh, our integrand. And uh, I think I already mentioned, this is a genus three hyperelliptic uh, integral. Um, these cycles, um, we have to be a bit careful. We want uh, these j's to be continuous. And uh, in a way that means we should look at a system uh, that is reduced by discrete symmetry. Our original system uh, has uh, discrete symmetry. You can uh, flat flip any xi to uh, its negative. Um, and uh, if you reduce by that symmetry or some subgroup of it, uh, then you get uh, cycles in that symmetry reduced system that give you continuous actions. So it's kind of a, a technical point, but it is important that we get something that is continuous, I think. And, uh, and so that's uh, um, achieved by this discrete symmetry reduction. Okay, so here are these uh, complicated hyperelliptic integrals, but uh, the uh, observation is that uh, something should actually be simple um, because if you have an integrable system uh, then you can write the Hamiltonian in terms of action variables right? and uh, well and we also know that this Hamiltonian has a periodic flow in fact after taking the square root it's an s1 action and uh, so this must be something simple in terms of actions and it is just the sum of the actions. Uh, and uh, this is actually easy to prove. The observation really is that uh, when you add these integrals, you can contract all these paths and they make a path around infinity. And the residue of, uh, of this uh, P at infinity is uh, the square root of H, square root of minus H. And then uh, you get exactly this. Okay, so uh, now, uh, Remember, we want to do reduction uh, with respect to uh, this uh, sum. And uh, well, and uh, that's not easy in action variables. Uh, basically, you just uh, have to throw away the angle variable that's conjugate uh, to the sum. And now you could choose any of the other two actions uh, as your reduced action. Um, there is choice there. Um, but uh, but any choice is good enough. Uh, the reason why this works is that uh, this matrix uh, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, I mean, that's a new modular transformation, right? And so we can introduce this as a new action variable and then just uh, reduce by the flow of that action variable 
Uh, and that means we just look at the remaining action variables. And that gives us action variables for the system G1, G2 on S2 cos S2 that I described before. Um, the integrals are quadratic. We're, that's because they come from, from uh, Steckel's construction. And uh, in fact, this is uh, a special case of uh, what is called the Malakoff top, uh, which is an integral system that lives on S O N. Um, okay, sorry, <laughs> I had a phone going off here. Yeah, no, it's, it's okay. Uh, Maybe. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Sorry, hold. Um, um, so it's a special case of the what is called the Manakov top, uh, which is a system in general uh, that lives on, on the Lie algebra of S O N. Uh, and uh, was introduced by Manakov in 76 uh, and then also studied uh, from the point of view of separation of variables by Moser. Uh, the Moser was interested in the geodesic flow on ellipsoids, uh, which is also related to the system uh, in, a, in a slightly different way. Uh, and then let me mention Komarov and Kuznetsov uh, and uh, then the latest paper by Shilinsky, um, who studied this particular uh, case also that we're interested in now. Okay, uh, so this is a much studied uh, system and uh, so now uh, our momentum map, uh, actually I should go back, it's just now the map that uh, maps S2 cross S2 into J1, J2, J3, uh, but since the sum of these J's is constant, uh, Instead of uh, deciding that we're going to take J1 and J2 or not, uh, the best way to do this is to say, let's uh, just look at the plane uh, where J1 plus J2 plus J3 uh, is constant. And we can uh, maybe fix it to one, let's say, the value of the Hamiltonian. And uh, so that's our momentum map. And uh, well, by this little uh, lemma that I wrote down, uh, that is already the proof that the image of that momentum map is a triangle, uh, just because the sum of these uh, is constant. And, is, and so it's rigid. So when we change these parameters, E1, 2, 3, 4, um, and there are two essential parameters uh, only, then uh, this will remain a triangle, the same triangle. Um, but uh, there is structure inside of this triangle. Right? So if you had a toric system, I guess then the, the, the polygon uh, or polytope is all there is. Uh, but here we have singularities. Uh, and so these interior lines are hyperbolic uh, regular. Uh, uh, that means uh, that, uh, that in their pre-image is not just uh, a circle of critical points, but uh, typically some more complicated object uh, attached as a separatrix. Uh, these lines out here, they are elliptic regular. And uh, for the rank two points uh, here, we've written down what, uh, what their type is, elliptic, 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 hyperbolic, etc. cetera. Um, there's also two degenerate points here. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's basically the structure. All right. uh, so for any interior point, it looks like this, but uh, where exactly these uh, structures sit in the polytope, uh, that depends on the parameters. Uh, and I should point out that also the multiplicity, uh, uh, that means the number of tori that you have in the pre-image of a uh, point here uh, is not uh, constant, but it's two uh, in these three chambers and it's four uh, in this chamber. Uh, which is uh, maybe on some on a topological level the main difference if you want to a uh, toric system where it's very crucial that you have a single torus in, in the pre-image. Okay, and uh, now I will show you just uh, uh, how this picture changes when you move around in the polytope and uh, how uh, in particular onto the edges and uh, corners. There's a lot of computation behind here that I will not show I, uh, to establish that these are degenerate points or non-degenerate points and their type, et cetera. Um, but I'll just show uh, the pictures now. 
Okay, so uh, up here is the general case one, two, three, four, it just means that all the E's, these four parameters are distinct. And uh, that's our case. Um, now, if we make E3 and E4 equal, um, then we get one of these uh, oblate coordinate system. Uh, and uh, how do you deform this picture to this picture? Well, basically you have to move this green and this yellow, line, uh, this, sorry, this green and this gray line uh, up and then uh, to the edge here, right? And just the orange line will remain. That's what happens. So, so that's kind of how you see these degeneracies happening. This is the case on the edge. So it has now uh, a global S1 action, uh, basically because there's rotational symmetry here because E3 and E4 are the same. Um, but uh, it still uh, has a hyperbolic line inside. So that's not a semi-toric system. Um, if, uh, however, you basically deform this uh, by pushing down the gray line and this, uh, well, it's basically all four lines uh, to the bottom, uh, then uh, you get a much simpler image uh, of your momentum map. Uh, the only issue is that there's still a focus focus point here sitting on the boundary of that. Um, okay, uh, that's what happens when you uh, make E2 and E3 equal. So from the point of view of uh, coordinate systems, it's not clear uh, really why this is fundamentally different, uh, uh, but uh, it is. Uh, so this gives us a semi-toric system if you make the middle axis equal, while if you make outer axis equal, uh, you don't get a semi-toric system. Right, let me maybe, uh, this is an unusual case, uh, let me, uh, which also has hyperbolic singularities, um, but it is really kind of a nested uh, separation uh, of S3, which contains spherical coordinates on S2 inside. And then two corners. Uh, so one is just spherical coordinates. Um, and uh, this is a system that we've seen, uh, I think, uh, in Alexei's talk, uh, or some version of it. Uh, this has a degenerate point. Uh, at one of the edges. So it looks as if it's toric, uh, but it's uh, only uh, almost toric. Um, and I think uh, that this is uh, exactly a singularity of the type that he talked about it, but uh, uh, that would have to be checked. And then finally, um, in this uh, cylindrical coordinate system, you get a toric system. So there's nothing degenerate, no extra singularities here. And so that's the simplest case if you want. All right, and uh, I, I hope uh, now I have a, at least explained a bit more uh, the, the main theorem. This is the same thing that I uh, showed you in the beginning. So every system obtained in this way um, has this momentum map whose image is a triangle and it's rigid. Um, the other polytope, the, um, our moduli space tells us uh, a bit about special cases and uh, for any thing on the edge of the pentagon uh, we have a global s1 action and for corners we have a global t2 action in one case and a kind of almost global t2 action in, in other corners okay uh, I, I maybe still have a little bit of uh, uh, time left uh, to talk about the quantum case uh, so in a quantum case uh, you get commuting operators. Uh, and in this case, these are represented by Fuchsian differential equations. Uh, I mentioned uh, those uh, when I talked about the separation of a uh, Laplacian. Um, what is uh, really beautiful uh, in the setting is that uh, you can uh, characterize the quantum states in a very simple way by just saying the quantum states are solutions of these uh, differential equations that, have, that are polynomial solutions. And, and that's it. Um, it's kind of uh, related to boundary value problems, uh, but uh, it doesn't look like it in this way. But uh, anyway, that's a nice characterization. And uh, these have also been studied. Uh, so there's a lot known, uh, of course, about uh, polynomial solutions of uh, Fuchsian equations. Um, 
let me just show you how the generation scheme works uh, in the quantum setting. Uh, so for a Foxian equation, uh, maybe the, the most important number is how many regular singular points there are. Um, and uh, here we have uh, one at infinity and the finite regular singular points, they are zeros of this polynomial A that has pole uh, roots at E1, E2, E3, E4. Um, and uh, if you have uh, two finite regular singular points, then that's called the hypergeometric equation. If you have three, then that's called the Hoyne equation. If you have uh, more, then we run out of names. And I'll just write uh, four. Um, so the joint spectrum uh, you can show in the momentum map. Uh, anyway, but first the degeneration scheme here. So in the middle, we have four regular singular points. On the edges, we have three uh, finite regular singular points. And uh, on the corners, uh, there's only two, right? So you have uh, something more complicated, called sometimes called generalized Lamy, uh, then Hoyne. Uh, on the edges, the Hoyne equations. On the corner, uh, the hypergeometric equation. Um, this is only the equation with the highest number uh, of points. There are uh, extra equations uh, as well. The one is not enough. Okay, and now let me show you uh, um, the quantum spectrum in the image of this momentum map. Um, and I'm calling this uh, joint spectrum origamo for the following reason. Uh, so this is our momentum map, uh, J1, J2, J3. Um, and uh, whenever there are states on the boundary, uh, then that means uh, that you can think of this as folded. Uh, and uh, this has states on both boundaries. And so you should unfold it twice and then you get uh, this uh, from this origami procedure. Uh, and that is almost our Delzan polytope, except uh, uh, you need to uh, rotate uh, uh, this to get the standard Z2 lattice, and then it is actually Delzan. Um, what happens here is that these quantum states, they're in red here, they have multiplicity four. Uh, in this representation, uh, in this triangle momentum map. And when we do this origami unfolding, uh, we have multiplicity one for all of them. And that's what you want in a toric system, of course. So our representation is kind of uh, not optimal for the toric cases, uh, but uh, at least uh, there's an easy way to recover the toric cases. So what about the semi-toric cases? So again, here's our triangle. Uh, and uh, you see, again, there is uh, a, an edge uh, that carries uh, quantum states. And that means we should uh, unfold it. Uh, and this unfolding basically also means that one of these action variables uh, becomes a signed action in a natural way, uh, corresponding to rotational symmetry. Um, and when we do that, uh, then we get our semi-toric polygon invariant. Uh, one of them, right? It's a, it's a family we get. This is the one with the cut above. Uh, for those of you that, uh, that know this theorem, uh, Alvaro described this uh, in, uh, in his talk a little bit. Okay, so those are the kind of uh, well understood cases. So here is a, another one uh, that is, uh, at least uh, I don't understand it as well, um, but I think uh, what we have is spherical uh, coordinates. Um, and uh, in our system, uh, again, there is uh, an edge and we should unfold and it fold. Uh, then uh, you get uh, this triangle with a degenerate point here. And again, I think it's exactly the picture that uh, Alexei showed us. Uh, so this is a non-Delzant uh, system at, with a toric uh, spherical singularity here. All right, and uh, this is uh, uh, the, the last picture I want to show. Uh, a case on the edge. Uh, so it has a global S1 action, but it has hyperbolic singularities. Um, and again, we this unfolding because we have a global S1 action uh, and uh, we get this picture. Uh, but uh, you see now that there is this whole line of hyperbolic singularities in here instead of just the focus focus point. And so what we need is to a theory that would say we have to assign a family of Taylor series to this line and deal with the degenerate endpoints 
uh, to classify these systems. And maybe uh, I'll just uh, not talk about harmonic polynomials. Uh, so there's a nice connection to that, but uh, I'm out of time. So let me just finish by a uh, little recap. So separation of variables and reduction gives us this interesting family uh, on compact uh, synthetic manifolds. And uh, so we have all kinds of interesting systems in that family. Uh, this whole thing would generalize to higher dimensions. Um, and uh, there we would have toric systems and, uh, and uh, even uh, much more complicated things. Uh, relation to special functions, I have not really had time to talk about, but uh, when you uh, think about the quantum case and you see that uh, all these classical integral systems uh, are actually systems that naturally correspond to uh, the classical uh, special functions. And uh, what I hope is that uh, by just showing you an example, uh, which in a way is fairly elementary, uh, but uh, nevertheless, it goes way beyond what we currently understand that, uh, that this might uh, push the development of the, of the general theory a bit further. And with that, uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so I'm going to be the, the substitute chairman since uh, Manuel has had to go and <laughs> Amna had some technical difficulties. Uh, so does anyone have any questions? Well, first of all, uh, thanks Holger for your wonderful talk. Uh, so uh, does anyone would like to ask uh, something? Hello. <laughs> Hi, I actually have some questions. Um, indeed, still struggling with the technical issues. But um, uh, you said that, uh, so when you were saying about moving lines from within the polytope, could you elaborate? Um, yes. Um, so I'm, I said here is, this is the moduli space for these integrable systems, right? And so when you move a point uh, in this moduli space, it means you're changing your integrable system. Right? And uh, then I was uh, describing basically, uh, uh, let's say you are, this corresponds to an interior point in the polygon, and now you're moving that point in the moduli space towards this edge, which has this label one, two, three, four, let's say, right? And when you do that, uh, your integral system deforms, and that means the location of these uh, critical values uh, will also deform. Right? Oh, and, yeah. uh, and that's what we try to color code here. They will deform in this way that this gray line basically is pushed towards the red line, and this green line is pushed towards the blue line. And that's how this the most general picture degenerates into this simpler picture, which has a global S1 action. And in a similar way, I guess, for all the other cases, right? Um, I see. One uh, should really make a move of this, right? And say, okay, here you see the point moving in the moduli space, and then you see how the uh, integral system deforms at the same time, but uh, maybe for, for the next time. <laughs> Yeah, it would be amazing. Um, and the reason that you're trying to reduce the multiplicity when you're folding them out is because of the um, the number of tori's um, uh, in the pre-image. That's you just want to. Yes. So that's yeah, exactly. Um, so in the general case, at least I don't have a good way of, of getting rid of the multiplicity. In particular, the multiplicity is not even constant. Right? But when you are uh, in, in a case where you have this global S1 action, uh, you see that multiplicity is two everywhere. And this is an exact uh, degeneration. And that means you should be able to kind of unfold uh, to get uh, to multiplicity one. And, and that was this, uh, this origami step. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Um, excellent. But, and also because in a toric system, I guess you want this Multiplicity one, right? I mean, and the proof also of convexity and so on is very important, right? That you have a singular connected component, right, in the pre-image, right? And and I'm trying to recover that as much as possible. Ah, uh, yes. Sorry, <laughs> very silly questions, um, but thanks for, um, yeah, thank you very much for answering them. Yeah, not at all silly. <laughs>
Okay, so are there any more questions? No? Actually, sorry, just one more, just sorry. <laughs> okay, um, so, <laughs> feel free. <laughs> uh, another silly question. But you know, when you said that uh, the, the triangle was rigid, I was wondering if you um, put scalars in front of every uh, momentum uh, map. So, you know, if you had a scalar, uh, a, J1, B, J2, C, J3, would that change the shape of the triangle in any way or? Well, it, it probably would, but I guess the, then you would have to ask yourself why, uh, where would they come from, right, in this, in mm -hmm. this construction? Because somehow, I mean, we're here, we are forced to really, we want to reduce by this global S1 action that comes from the Hamiltonian. And so you can't have any factors here in that, in that construct. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm not sure uh, how, how you would achieve that. Uh, I mean, the actions are very rigid objects themselves, right? If, uh, if you just, if you multiply them, uh, just one of them by, by a factor and not the others, then. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I have to think about that. Thanks very much.